Welcome to Lifestyle Solopreneur, the community for entrepreneurs who put lifestyle first. Join your host, Flavia Barris, as she interviews successful lifestyle solopreneurs and shares ideas to help you find the perfect balance between lifestyle, business, and self. Flavia is an attorney, marketing expert, and founder of several online academies. She's been featured in major media, including BBC World News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, ESPN Television, and more. Join us for this episode of Lifestyle Solopreneur. Hey, Lifestyle Solopreneurs. Today we get to meet Scott Harris. He is a multifaceted person. He does many things. His primary business is in real estate support. He inspects commercial properties for buyers and does very well at it. He is also a commercial pilot and a public speaker. Welcome to the show, Scott. Hello. Hey, Scott. So tell us a little bit more about this commercial pilot thing, because I think everyone just pictures you at like Chicago O'Hare Airport running down the hall, you know, wheelie bag in tow, wearing a pilot uniform. Is that what you do or something a little different? No, something a little different. I kind of a barnstormer commercial pilot. I uh, currently I'm the chief pilot at a uh, significant parachute center here in the Pacific Northwest outside of Portland. It's called PNW Skydiving. And I also jumped there. I've managed several other pilots, so I'm not the only guy flying the airplane. It's a 17-passenger turboprop airplane, so it's, I mean, it's a lot of people would call it a puddle jumper, but it's hardly that. And it's a lot of fun. I don't have to wear a tie. I fly all summer in sandals, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's critical flying. It's not aerobatics, but it's kind of close in some ways. I used to teach aerobatics and I was a flight instructor at one time. I've always flown. I've been flying since I was 12 years old. I got into commercial flying really to help run a parachute center many years ago. I put myself through college teaching people to skydive, running a parachute center. You may actually win, at least for the month of most unique professions, right? There's very few skydive instructors. I'd imagine they're just really aren't oh, that I can many top nationwide. It. Oh, <laughs> I can top it. What's in that? in about 1992, I think it was, I was a paparazzi. I parachuted into Elizabeth Taylor's wedding to take pictures of the wedding when she married Larry Fortensky on Michael Jackson's Neverland estate. That has got to have, you have no colleagues in that field. I mean, there's nope. just, there's just you. Who else, who else does a parachute paparazzi? I mean, no. you should, you should trademark parachute paparazzi because that is, <laughs> that is a great, great pass. And I bet you that wasn't the only time you donned your parachute and grabbed your camera. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it wasn't a one and only. It, it kind of was, to be honest. At the time, I was actually working as a commercial photographer. So I did a lot of, I took a lot of pictures, but I'd never done anything like paparazzi type thing before. I was put up to it by a buddy of mine who worked for ABC News and basically told me there's a news blackout. They're not letting anybody in. How would you get there? He kind of knew he, I taught him to fly. He knew me pretty well, but the thing is, is like, I thought, oh, this is cool. I can make money doing this. And I, and I actually got a couple of assignments from the inquirer afterwards, but it was all just kind of horrible. And I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Sitting outside, waiting for somebody to answer the door and try to catch them with a new boyfriend or something like that. It just, that set felt dirty to me and I couldn't do it. The jumping into the estate, that seemed fine to me. It was her eighth wedding. I mean, how special, <laughs> but. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you probably made her wedding extra special because that was quite a sight. And I'm sure the guests looked up and said, we are at the spectacle event of the century. There is a paparazzi parachuting in to take photos of this. We are where it's at. <laughs> and uh, nowadays, when you see people doing this with drones, um, where the drones buzz over places and take video, you probably look up and go, yeah, amateurs. <laughs> Cause that's, um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Not well, the same. That is very interesting. Um, and I'm sure that was a very exciting era for you and your career. But now you're sort what? of split. You split your time, right? Between piloting yeah. and also real estate support services. Well, and, and public speaking. I basically have three jobs. I inspect commercial property for people who are buying it. And uh, I actually teach other people to do the same thing. And then I, I'm a full-time chief pilot at the Parachute Center, which is 
several days a week, actually, I'm flying. And then I travel and I wrote two books this year. My pandemic projects were to write a book that I've threatened to write for the last decade about commercial property maintenance. And I got all excited and I wrote another book called At the Same Time that I actually finished first. It's called Leap Forward. And that's all about motivational stuff. It's all about self-improvement. In my lifetime, I've learned, I'm a little weird. I mean, I do so many different things and I've always been like that. I always kind of going from one thing to another or doing several things at the same time. I learned at a very young age how much I seek out challenge and how that really fuels me. And I have learned things about how to face challenge and embrace it and how how much it can enhance your life to not hold yourself back and how it can improve your own performance to be accepting of the things that come before you instead of resistive. And that's really what that whole book, Leap Forward, is all about is the different experiences that I've had as a national champion skydiver and later as a national champion polo player, the lessons that I learned to achieve that level of performance and and some other obstacles. I've been hurt a couple of times rather seriously and how I overcame those challenges and the lessons that I've learned that I can share with people to help them face their own challenge. Now, I'm guessing that your public speaking centers around that book, probably, and not the real estate, but correct me if I'm wrong. Leap forward. The real estate, it's kind of an encyclopedia. It's kind of funny because there is, there's hundreds of books about how to maintain your house. There's only one book that tell you how to maintain commercial property. Mine. That's it. There's nothing else out there. There's lots of articles about roofing and siding and plumbing, but no comprehensive journal or what have you that addresses all different types of property and how to maintain them and ma- you know manage your finances or your capital management of the maintenance of that property. And how did you fall into the real estate world and uh, home inspect or commercial property inspections and becoming an expert in this area? What led to that? Well, when I was, uh, I was actually an engineering officer in the Merchant Marine, and I spent a lot of time in shipyards working on ships and testing them and stuff like that. But I spent so much time traveling that I wanted out. So from there, I went to a uh, engineering consulting firm that had me doing startups in power plants and water treatment plants. And eventually they would send me out to different plants all over the country, and I would set up operational procedures for those plants. And then we would bid to take them over and run them instead of having the municipality run them at a fraction of what the municipality paid to run them, but at phenomenal profits. It was really kind of obscene. But essentially, I was going out and inspecting these facilities and telling, uh, deciding what they needed and then uh, reporting that to someone else. And after that, I, I'm kind of an entrepreneur mentality. It's hard for me to stay long working for others. I've done it successfully, but I eventually, I, I have to be self-employed. I just, it's just in my DNA. So I left that and I became a general contractor and I was building things. And I had clients that would ask me to go out and They had had me build something for them, and then they decided to buy an existing building, and they would ask me to go out and look at it for them. And it was kind of the same thing I had done for the consulting firm. And I would go out, and I would inspect this property, and I would tell them what the conditions were, what was wrong with it, what I thought they'd have to spend to fix it over the next few years. And that just kind of started to take over my world. And so I kind of sold my construction company and just started doing commercial property inspections. I eventually added residential uh, home inspections to the mix, but I really don't do very many of those. I do some. I've built houses and I I have fun doing that, helping out, you know, a family buy their first house. But mostly I inspect commercial property for people who are buying it for the most part. Uh, Sometimes I've been doing a lot of schools lately that just want to predict what their expenses are going to be. And that's kind of rewarding as well. But it's all about maintenance. It's all about how to maintain the property and what does it cost to maintain things or fix it if it needs it. And uh, it's kind of what I've always done, to be perfectly honest. It's just you know, it, it's just how it evolved. Well, you know what I, I love about people like you who have so many different 
niches that you work in, so many different areas of special specialty. I think that what's beautiful is that you can jump from one world to the other seamlessly and also that you find the time to sort of fit all of these different careers into just one person's schedule. How do you do that and stay sane? Because I could imagine that any one of these could consume a person's schedule completely, but you're able to balance them. Well, my sanity might be debatable amongst some. I just, I love everything I do. So it's kind of easy. I mean, it takes a little bit of juggling, but for the most part, the skydiving doesn't happen till later in the day or on the weekends. And I inspect property. I start early in the morning, like most construction and go till mid afternoon. So there isn't really that much conflict there. The only time there's a conflict is if I have to travel to inspect and I can usually work that out with somebody else and I can still fly three or four days a week and fly on the weekends and, you know, a couple of afternoons. And that keeps me real busy there and keeping up with managing the other guys to make sure that the drop zone is covered all the time. So I, I do 40 hours a week or more inspecting property. And I probably put in 20, 25 hours a week flying. And the rest of the time I'm, you know, in the evenings, I'm marketing and communicating with uh, people around the country to set up uh, speaking gigs, either virtual or in person. And that's taking over. I, I have this thought that over the next three or four years, I'm going to be selling my inspection business and moving over to public speaking full time. But, you know, that has to happen. You know, it'll happen. I'm going to push it there, but it's it has to happen. And when you speak, when you do your public speaking, generally, what is your message? Um, I'm sure that you tailor the talk to each different event or what that right. crowd might be or audience, but right. um, I in general, to what do you want people to audience. come away with? I want people to understand that if they can conquer their, their own fears and stop holding themselves back, that you know, life is a never-ending journey of self-improvement. As long as you're continuously trying to be better and do better, everything's going to get better. And, you know, and that's what life is all about. It's about constantly learning and constantly trying to be better than you are. There's no fixed goal in life. You're not trying to reach some specific height. The idea is to continue, you know, look at where you are and constantly try to be better than where you are, no matter where that is. And in that is where the greatest joy in life can be found and the greatest reward. Because if you're happy and you're passionate about what you're doing and you're looking forward and moving forward, you're going to do better. You're going to be better and you're going to get more. Wonderful messaging. I mean, that's that's something that we all need to hear often. And it's easy to, to lose sight of all of that as well. Particularly, yeah, life is life. If you're always in a hurry um, to get somewhere and you truly treat life as sort of a, something where you have to get through each day so that you can make it to some final destination you're aiming for, you're really going to just miss out on life, right? Because the day to day, this is the life that we are living. I love that you played polo. I'm, I'm assuming, is that horse polo or water polo? Yeah. No, no. Real polo on horses. The polo thing is really kind of funny. I was uh, kind of backing away from skydiving. I had children at home and I wasn't really able to compete anymore. I didn't have time for it. And uh, I was mostly in construction at that period. And uh, I started, there was a small polo club that opened up not far from where I live. And I thought, well, this would be funny. You know, I could say that I played polo. I mean, I really didn't think this was something that I was really going to do. I just thought, well, I'll give it a try because I like trying new things. I like doing new stuff. And uh, within about, I really hit it off with the instructor. Within about six weeks, I ended up buying my first horse. I was so hooked. It was unbelievable. And it became, my whole life revolved around polo for many years. And, you know, I could ride before, but I only became a, you know, a genuine equestrian at that period in my life. And when I was 40, I want to say 40, yeah, later 40s, I won the Amateur Arena Polo Championships in, at that time it was held in Santa Barbara. It's a pretty isolated thing. Polo isn't something that everybody plays. It's not like winning the nationals in, in baseball or football, what every kid in the country is, you know, is playing, but, uh, it meant a lot to me. And, uh, it was kind of funny because I, I won the National Amateur Arena Polo Championships 20 years after winning the National 
collegiate skydiving championships to the day, 20 years to the day, the two trophies have the same date on them. Well, that's that is incredible. <laughs> Separated by 20 years. I mean, it was, you know, when they handed me the, the trophy, I looked at it and I couldn't believe it because it was, you know, I looked at the date. And that's what it hit me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Two very unique sports. I mean, not many people even participate in either of those sports. Uh, skydiving, for sure. Uh, probably more people, I would say, skydive than play horse polo. But both. Well, uh, I think more club. people have tried skydiving. Being actual skydivers or licensed and in charge of their own jumping, that that's probably a smaller group. Polo is played all over the world. Skydiving is not. But I do notice both of say. those are adrenaline <laughs> sports, right? You would say so, yeah. For it, most people. It, uh, yeah, you reach a point, I'd sleep in the airplane on the way up. You get used to almost anything. But it's still, it's a big charge. It's still a big charge. And if you don't have a little anticipation about what you're doing, you probably shouldn't be doing it. That fear is protecting you. Of course. And do you think that um, because you, you pilot now the airplane that has all of the first timers too in the back. Do you sort of feed off of all of that nervousness and excitement and fear and, you know, all that energy coming from behind you as, yeah, as you're taking them it's up? Yeah, it's fun to be picture. part of that. It's it's fun to be part of the energy. And a, a parachute center is a really fun place. It's just, it's, the, it's one of the neatest groups of people ever because they come from, you, you'll get people there from all walks of life from everywhere. You know, you'll have a wealthy guy and a plumber and a, and a soldier and a housewife on a skydive together. And they're the best of friends out there. And, it, and it's really neat. And it's a very inclusive cr culture. All anybody cares out at a parachute center is that you have a love of skydiving. They don't care about anything else. They don't care. How, you know, there's well, no, there are no race. There's no race. There's no religion. There's no, none of that. It just doesn't exist. Nobody cares. No, but I, I'll say, and maybe the lawyer in me kind of uh, chuckles at this, but skydiving centers have the most comprehensive liability waiver known to man. I mean, that's that's the one, at least the skydiving center I went to made oh, every yeah. participant watch a video as well, not just sign the oh. document. Oh, you, you jumped at Paris Valley. <laughs> uh, I don't recall the name. Um, I could show it to you on a map. In yeah. California. Yeah. I used, I used to teach there. I was a tandem master at Paris for many years. It was, used to be run by some friends of mine, but yeah, they have, there's a lawyer out there that, that kind of got them on that path and they would literally, they'd make you watch a video. They'd, you'd sign, they'd videotape you signing the waiver. It's a little nutty. Yeah. And, but people still, uh, go through all those steps and they take their, their trip up to the sky and jump out of an airplane. You know, it's uh, you'd think it would yep. dissuade people from doing it. It really didn't. Every single person um, that was in that waiting room when I went, yep, they do signed, it. put on their harness, <laughs> jumped in the plane and went for it. Yep. Oh yeah. Once people decide to do it, it's very rare that somebody backs down, you know, and I've been in and around skydiving for over 40 years. I've seen, a, you know, three or four people back down. You know, just say, no, they get up in the plane and say, no, I'm not doing it. It's rare. You know, once you get there, it's you're motivated to follow through. Well, and you see the people before you go and there is kind of a herd mentality, right? Like, well, they went, I'm going to go too. So what's your next book called? Is it called Jump? <laughs> no, but it'll be, an, it'll be a, you know, an extension of Leap Forward. It well, will. I loved hearing about the books you have written. Um, I'm excited to know what books you still have in you to write in the future. And I, I will, I'm almost scared to ask, but I, you know, what's the next hobby that you want to try? Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to keep the ones alive that I've been doing. I'm trying to play a little polo and skydive as I have, I'm expanding my flying. So I'm still working at getting better at some things and I'm doing some mildly competitive skydiving and we'll see where that goes. I'm really quite excited about sharing my experience with the world, to be honest, of all the things that I'm doing, I'm most excited about that for the future. So the other things be... are things I continue to do because they bring me great joy. It's fun to do stuff that you're good at. Everybody has a good time doing things that they're confident in doing. There's people listening that have one job that they hate. You're somebody who has numerous jobs that you love. What would you say to that person sitting at a desk or in a cubicle or driving around who's just feeling trapped by their job 
It's not a job they enjoy. They have zero passion for it. Listening to you, they probably are a little bit wistful, but maybe they think uh, there's no way that they could have a life with so much variety and passion and fun. What would you say to that person? Actually, I have a lot to say to that person. I have a couple chapters in my book that devoted just to that. I've done all these things. and But part of that is I had opportunities to follow these things and I worked at them and I made sacrifices to do that. And not everybody can make that. I mean, if some guy who, or gal who's stuck in a job that they don't, they don't really love and they dread going to work, but they need that job because they need to feed their family or they're in a stuck in a situation that it's too hard to just they can't just quit or they don't feel they can just quit. They have to find it within themselves, you know. So it's not just about doing a dream job or having a dream job. It's about being happy with what you have. One of the biggest tricks in life is about acceptance. It's about taking what you have and make the best of it. And sometimes that's you have to make the best out of a out of a bad situation. If you have a job with a boss that you hate, you have to look past that and you have to find a way to feel good about doing a good job and feel good about feeding your family and feel good about your future that you maybe you're going to you're going to do so well that you're going to get promoted out of that situation or you're going to take classes at night to this job you don't like it but you're going to find a way to move into something else in the future and you can feel good about that but feeling being happy or being miserable is inside you. It's not the job. It's not the environment. Everyone's ultimate pleasure is something that they have to own themselves and provide to themselves. It's not coming from something external. It never is. So I realize this sounds a little convoluted, but it's it's a really important and complicated subject that you can't just be happy by walking away from something if if it's inside yourself that's not happy. If you, you know, if you're a trained as a mechanic and you hate working under, you know, in an auto shop because you hate everybody there, well, maybe it's not everybody there. Maybe it's your attitude about that shop. Or maybe, you know, you hate working for someone else. You want to have your own shop. Well, you have to work towards that and make that happen and feel good about taking the steps to make that happen and find joy in that by doing your very best at what you're doing so that you can help get to that state. But just being miserable and feeling trapped and that's just not reality. Nobody is that trapped. Nobody's that much of a slave that you can't work your way into a better situation with a positive attitude and hard work. Well, life is not static. It's true. We can't be complacent because minute by minute, life can change. New opportunities can show up. But if someone doesn't like the job they're in, you know, I agree with you. The first step is to find a way uh, to sort of change how you feel rather than first changing your exterior circumstances, because uh, there's people who have what outwardly would seem like a, a great job or a great life, and they're miserable because they haven't found the inner peace and the inner joy. So it, it is, it's not an easy solution, right? When somebody tells you, I'm stuck in a job I hate, I don't like right. my life, I'm not enjoying anything right now, would be, it's the self-work, it's the inner work. And then it's knowing that whatever your circumstances, your job might be today, there's a way to change that because life is not static. In fact, even if somebody loves their job, life is not static. It's very possible you won't have that job in five years, 10 years, who knows? And so we just have to be open to change. And if we're not happy with where we are, find a way to find joy in the journey and and journey onwards, you know, make it to somewhere as leap forward, right? It really is more about the journey than it is the place. And there's a way to find joy in you know, and all that striving to get ahead or to move into a better situation. And so with those words, Scott, where can people connect with you to find out more, to read your book, to learn a little bit more about what you're working on and uh, to get in touch? Well, I have a website. It's scottkharris.com. My book is for sale on the website and it's also for sale on Amazon. And interestingly enough, it's for sale on Audible, as well as Amazon, as an audiobook that I recorded myself, which is a pretty neat product. I'm actually quite proud of it. I think that 
I have enjoyed audiobooks myself that are read by the author. The author can really emphasize the things that they meant to be important. And it's hard to get some of that nuance just off the printed page, especially with subjects as impactful as uh, the ones that I'm dealing with in Leap Forward. So lifestyle solopreneurs, be sure to go to Scott kharris.com. That's Scott with two T's, Scott kharris.com. Connect with Scott. Scott, thank you so much for being on the show today. You've been amazing to chat with. I hope to one day see you in a skydiving airplane or on a polo field, more even at a commercial property. I do a little bit of real estate myself. So I hope we get to connect again soon. Terrific, Flavia. It's been really fun. Thank you for having me on the show. Guess what, lifestyle solopreneurs? If you don't yet have an online business earning you enough passive income to live the life of your dreams, I'd like to suggest you consider trying out Kajabi. Kajabi is an all-in-one solution where you can create and teach online courses, publish a paid newsletter, launch a free or paid podcast, process payments, build one-on-one coaching portals for your clients, and much, much more. I personally use Kajabi to power numerous successful and profitable online businesses. Lifestyle solopreneurs, there's a free trial of Kajabi waiting for you at this link, www.kfreetrial.com. You can try Kajabi for free, no obligation, by going to www.kfreetrial.com. Again, kfreetrial.com, and that K stands for Kajabi. Starting an online business helped me break free from that corporate grind, and I hope it does the same for you. You have nothing to lose and absolutely everything to gain. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and see you next time.